Right, so how do you choose the right guide? Um, you have to follow a set of <laughs> principles that are valid for any guide that you use. So you want to get something that allows you for coaxial engagement. You want to get something that gives you an angle as close to zero between the guide and the coronary. You want to have backup, especially for a complex case. You want the guide to rest against either the aortic wall or the coronary cusp with an angle that's um, closer to 90 degrees here. And you want to achieve all that without any pressure ventricularization or dampening. You don't want to create any injury at the site of the um, engagement. So um, I cannot stress out how important this coaxial engagement is. Sometimes we forget about that, in particular with um, when using an AL1, for instance, for a right coronary artery. It looks good in the LEO projection, and then you move to RAO, and it looks like this. Uh, this is not coaxial. You want to get this scenario here where the guide sits coaxial with the corner. This will save you a lot of trouble down the road. Of course, we don't always need um, an active guide support. Sometimes we can use what is called a passive guide support. The passive guide support is what a JR would give you. So this catheter does not rest against the aorta at all, and the only support you get here is because of the shape of the guide. Um, obviously, you would choose this in a simpler procedure where you're concerned about the ostium, where you don't have any osteal trauma. If the procedure is more complex and you need more backup and support, you move to something that rests against some other structure, either the cusp, such as uh, is the case here with this hockey stick catheter, or the opposing aortic wall, such as the case with an AL type of guide. And of course, the higher, um, the more backup you have, the higher the risk of um, trauma to the ostia, so you have to be careful of that. And to keep it simple, basically, um, most of the time, if you have a complex right, you can use an AL type of shape that will provide you the most support you can get in general. Uh, while for the left coronary artery, we use EBU type of shapes. Uh, this goes for both radial and femoral. Sometimes we use an XB here, but there are variations on the same theme. They are uh, essentially the same guide uh, with different different slight, with slight differences. The other concept is that you want to switch the guide early. So if you, if you plan ahead and you think this guide would work and you put it in and then you try to wire and the wire pushes the guide out, then that's probably a good time to switch the guide out because you're not going to make much progress. You're going to hurt down the road. This is a very common occurrence of a, of a Shepherd's Crook RCA where the um, RCA uh, tracts superiorly. Very hard to get good coaxial engagement here and support. You want to move to something like a hockey stick or an XBRCA or even an undersized AL that would provide you support from the coronary cusp. You want to do this early. You don't want to wait um, until you get in the middle of the case and have, have problems at that point. So let's assume you got to the point where you have a guide in, uh, everything looks good, uh, but you still have trouble delivering equipment. This is where the uh, guideline extensions have been a godsend to us. Um, they allow us to do a lot more complex stuff now. Um, what a guideline extension does, which is essentially a catheter inside the guide catheter, it allows you to be more coaxial with the coronary artery, and it also, and sometimes you forget about this, it allows you to let the guide push out and push against the opposing wall of the aorta, so it provides you more backup as well. Going back to that scenario I was showing you of an AL in the right, um, again, you have here a very non-coaxial scenario, it's a 90 degree angle, this is an REO view of the right with a nail guide. Uh, if you put a guideliner in this, you sort of eliminate that coaxiality problem and you have nice access to the vessel um, and able to complete your procedure. There are um, two types of guide extensions, and I just learned that there is a third one from Medtronic now, the guideliner from Teleflex, which is the original guide extension that we had available in the US. Um, we have the Guidezilla now, Guidezilla 2 from Boston Scientific. Um, they come in 6, 7, and 8 French sizes. The guideliner comes in a 5.5 French size, which you can try to use if you have trouble delivering one of these extensions. Um, very subtle differences between these devices. Perhaps the Guidezilla has a little bit more support. Um, the guideliner has a nicer entry in the guideliner. Um, that's important, uh, but again, you know, use what you have and, uh, and familiarize yourself with, with uh, the equipment that you have in your lab. 
Um, it's important to understand that, and this kind of makes sense, the further in the vessel you go with the guide extension, the more backup and support you're going to have, and this is data supporting that. Basically, if you put the guide liner 15 millimeter in the vessel, you're going to have much more backup. Sometimes we take this guide liner as in the right, for instance, all the way to the crux. Now, you have to be careful with that because it comes at a cost. It can, create, it can create ischemia, and that's something you have to be fully aware of and not, don't forget about that. I'll, Touch base on, I'll touch on that a little bit later. So um, how do you deliver this, this um, guide extensions? Obviously, you do it over a wire. You already wired the vessel. Oftentimes, you have gear in the vessel as well, a balloon or even a stand. But let's say you don't have any proximal disease. There is some tortuosity, and you can't deliver the um, guide extension to where you need to go. There are a couple of tricks that you can do. Uh, one is to use a distal anchor balloon. Um, another one that's commonly used is to do uh, what's called balloon-assisted tracking. You can use a smaller size guide liner, you can use a 5.5 French guide liner inside of a 6, or even a 6 French guide liner inside of an 8 French guide, with some caveats. Or you can use a guide liner navigator. And this is a case illustrating this balloon-assisted tracking. It has several names um, that people use. So, Basically, this is a case of a very tortuous and calcified OM that used to be grafted, so we're going to fix the native. Um, we have reasonable uh, guide support here. We have the guide liner going in, and we can't deliver anything past this tortuosity. So the goal here is, after we balloon this, to try to get this guide liner down into the vessel further so that we're able to deliver the stent. So the way to do that, one way to do that at least, is to um, inflate the balloon right at the uh, tip of the guide liner, uh, and while deflating the balloon slowly, you advance the guide liner over the deflating balloon. Um, so basically, the balloon helps you to come off the edges and advance the guide liner. So this is called inchworming. One of our fellows in the lab called this the Pac-Man maneuver, which kind of stuck in our lab at least. <laughs> Um, then you have a really nice conduit to deliver the stent, um, and this is the final result. The other thing to note here is see how the guide liner pushes the guide out, and the guide now rests against the cusp on the, uh, on the other side of the aorta, so you have that's the extra backup that you get from the guide liner. So not only the fact that you're coaxial, not only the fact that you get around the bends and all the calcium spicules that you have in the vessel, but you also have better backup, so utilize that. This is a, another example of, again, a right coronary artery um, where we already put a stent distally. We're now using the stent balloon as an anchor to advance the guide liner down to the vessel to place the next stent. Um, so this is the anchor balloon technique. As you get closer to the balloon, again, you deflate this balloon slowly. Don't go fully negative. Go slowly on the, um, on the in deflator to allow this to collapse. As the balloon collapses, advance your guide liner. The um, problems that you can get with guide extensions are ischemia. Again, if your guide liner is really deep, you're going to have flow disturbance in that vessel. You're going to have ST changes. You have to be quick with this. You have to have the stent ready to deliver. You can dissect the vessel, and especially if you inject too hard. When you have a guide liner in, try to avoid injections through the guide liner because you can dissect the vessel or do them very gently. The other problem that's minor, um, but it can lead to a lot of stent deformation, is that sometimes the stent doesn't get in the guide liner, inside the guide catheter. And that can happen for a variety of reasons. It can happen because the wires are twisted or because the entry is slightly deformed. As you can see here, we have the stent coming up and it hits the guide liner entry. Um, and if, you don't, if you're not careful, you can strip the stent or at least deform it to the point where we can't use it anymore. So the way to get around that is uh, you can do a little angioplasty of the uh, guide liner entry. So you go with a 2.0 balloon and dilate gently at the entry in the guide liner. You can also move it up on the curvature of the aorta if you have that option. And then after that, the, um, the uh, delivery will be very smooth and you're not going to have any problem as illustrated here. So, so with that, uh, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take some questions. Great, thanks so much. I mean, clearly these guide extension catheters have really changed how we practice. I mean, I remember before we had them and how we struggled, and now some of these cases are, are frankly not doable without them. Any other thoughts on the panel um, about the other ways you can use this? I mean, what's your standard way of getting them down? Do we have preferred devices or specific things that you need to know, tips and tricks about them? 
Ryan, go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to make um, one point uh, about being coaxial. I, as the uh, director for our cath lab, uh, I get the, the joy of reviewing all the complications when they happen. And it's amazing um, when you look at, at nasty guide dissections, how often uh, the operator abandoned really the first principle that Catalan talked about, which is to be coaxial. And even though you get away with it, you know, you may get away with it nine times out of 10, there's gonna be that one instance where you're not coaxial that's gonna cause a major complication. Yeah, especially on the left mains, that's where we've seen a lot of them, especially people kind of getting more into their radial practice, they point straight up. Even a simple case can turn into a disaster with that final picture or something, so I agree. Um, I had some trouble um, sending equipment to the back end of the Guidezilla, and then my rep told me that Z on the back end, when you go from the femoral, is supposed to face up, and when you go through the radial, it's supposed to face down, and that kind of is really helpful to send the equipment down. And then now uh, Medtronic has another new one called the telescope, which is pretty good as well. So yeah. those two. And there are differences between them, too. The other thing to note is the length of the actual guide extension varies a little bit. Um, specifically, there's a trap liner, which wasn't mentioned, that has a trapping balloon on the inside of it. That tends to be a little bit shorter. And so in a case, um, and these are more advanced cases, but if you're taking it down a Lima, for instance, that proximal port can actually be in the Lima. And if that happens to you, then you're basically when you pull it out, you can totally dissect the origin of the lima. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. Well, I had a case recently where I had to use that to get the microcatheter trapped, and then I came out, and then I used the telescope to go further down because that had a longer extension. Um, great, uh, great overview, by the way. Just uh, one uh, tip that I found that helps from the radial is if you're going on the right, which I feel like the right corner is, as we all know, the most painful of all of them uh, for support is using AL.75 instead of maybe a one so you're not deep throating and then use a extension as needed. Uh, those are great points. <laughs>